and uh, I think the microphone is live. So, okay. Uh, well, welcome to uh, a, a session on uh, supporting virtualized telco functions with OpenStack. Uh, I'm Bruce Davey from VMware. Um, I work in our networking and security business unit, uh, which is the, uh, the group that, uh, that brought NSX to the world. Um, some of you may have heard of that, that product. And uh, I've been working at VMware uh, for a couple of years now since we, uh, I came in when VMware acquired Nasira. Um, hopefully some of you heard of Nasira uh, as a, an early uh, startup company in the space of software-defined networking. And uh, before that, I was a networking guy in, uh, in Cisco for a long time. So, uh, so I've been you know, doing networking in the, in the sort of telco space for quite a while. And uh, so what I want to talk about today is uh, how we're um, attacking the telco space in, from a perspective of virtualization and how that fits into the, to the bigger picture with OpenStack. Um, I mean, I maybe ask a few questions of the audience. So how many people here have, have been sort of following NFV for some time already? Okay, so maybe two-thirds of people have some NFV familiarity. So, so the first part of this presentation will be maybe a little bit of recap for you folks. Um, so um, what I mostly want to focus on today is the networking aspects of NFV. And it's a little bit confusing that NFV you know, has network in the name. But in fact, when a lot of people think about NFV, the first thing they think about is actually compute. So, that, so they, you know, they say, I'm going to take some function that was previously implemented in some box, and I'll move it into a virtual machine. And hey, presto, I've done network function virtualization. And so I guess if I, if I only convince you of one thing today, I just want you to think about NFV as being bigger than just taking things out of a box and putting them into a VM, that there's a, a, a larger component around particularly virtualizing the actual networking components. Um, and that's what I'll spend a lot of time talking about today. So sort of bullet two here is talking about how network virtualization fits in to the NFV landscape. Um, and then as we start getting into sort of some of the slightly more detailed parts of the presentation, I want to talk about service chaining specifically. Um, service chaining turns out to be something that has a lot of application in the, the telco environment. Um, you want to be able to create some customized collection of services for a customer, and that entails functions that might be implemented in different virtual machines or different boxes being connected together into some kind of chain. So I'll talk about sort of what are the problems in that space and um, how we're, we're tackling them. And uh, I'll at least make the assertion that some of the things that you would like to be able to do with service chaining are actually not that well supported by Neutron today. Um, and so there are some of the things work well, some things there's probably room for improvement. Um, I am, I'm not a, a Neutron developer or even a particularly a Neutron expert, um, but I've at least spent enough time looking at what you can do with Neutron to sort of see where it does and does not line up with the objectives for, um, for service chaining. And then um, I'm going to spend the last couple of minutes just talking a little bit about OVN, um, just because it sort of fits into this space a little bit, and it's just it's a super exciting development in the space of virtualized networking. It's much more broadly applicable than just the telco space, but it definitely fits in here. Um, and I just wanted to mention that um, it's something that some of my coworkers are, are driving the charge on. Um, how many people went to the OVN talk on Tuesday? Um, just a handful of people. Good. So you people, you won't learn anything new from that last bit, but for the rest of you, I'll just cover it real quick. Um, okay, so uh, let's launch in. Um, this is one of my, my favorite pictures about um, NFV. This actually comes from a pretty old white paper produced by Etsy. Um, you know, a bunch of people got together and, and started fleshing out this NFV architecture. And I think I, saw, I first saw this paper sometime in 2012. Um, one reason I like this picture is because it's sort of on the left hand side there's a whole bunch of telco boxes and I actually know what almost all of them do, um, which is not always the case when I look at a picture of, of telco equipment. Um, and so, you know, you notice all of those boxes, they come in different shapes and sizes and they're sort of vertically integrated. They're kind of like the mainframes of the, of the telco industry. And then if you look at the right hand side, this is where we want NFE to go with taking all of those sort of siloed, vertically integrated boxes and moving them into a much more kind of cloud type of architecture where we use standard high volume servers, storage, and networking and run all of these functions as virtual appliances or virtual machines or maybe even containers, but some kind of virtualized form factor on top of standard commodity stuff. And so, you know, for people in the OpenStack community, the sort of the right-hand side should hopefully look pretty comf comfortable and familiar. And, you know, what we're trying to do in some respects is help the telco industry sort of move from what is really a very sort of 20th century architecture to something that is, is much more contemporary and, and leverages the technologies that we have today. 
Um, I, I have learned uh, over years of talking to telco people, you should never say to a telco person, oh, your problem is just like this enterprise problem that we already solved. Um, but there are a lot of similarities and we are definitely trying to leverage some of the capabilities that we've, we've developed over the, the years for um, enterprises and, and public clouds. And uh, so now the, there's a lot of reasons why telcos are pretty excited about this kind of shift. Um, you know, by the way, how many people here actually work for a telco? Okay, quite a few. Um, so uh, hopefully some of this will, will um, ring true. Um, obviously telcos are under lots of competitive pressure and the, the, there's, I, I, there's a lot of reasons why this sort of moving to a more cloud-based architecture would be a good thing. So, you know, in maybe no particular order, um, if you think about rolling out services as a telco, you, you really don't want to have to go and dedicate a box to a service. Um, because over time, that service is going to become either more or less popular. If it becomes more popular, you're going to have to buy more boxes. And then at some point, it becomes less popular, and now you've got boxes that you can't do anything with. Much better to have a pool of capacity and then deploy services on top of that capacity and increase the amount of capacity you allocate to a particular service and do that in an elastic way. Um, and so you, know, you, can, you can now sort of think of your services as being decoupled from your hardware and that you know, maybe the demand for a service even fluctuates on a minute by minute basis so you can allocate more of your generic compute storage and networking resources to the services that need it. Um, another big issue is how long does it take to deploy a new service? Um, you know, when I first started working on network virtualization, the number one reason that we found ourselves getting into conversations with customers was that they wanted to be able to, to virtualize their networking and deploy network services as quickly as they could deploy virtual machines. Th this is very much the case for, for telcos. You know, the time to deploy a new service in the telco environment is, you know, is often measured in, in years. So you know, to be able to get it down to more of the kind of, I'm just going to install a bunch of new software you know, running virtual appliances and spin them up in a highly automated way is obviously very attractive. And then finally, the, 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 in order to sort of provide more differentiation, it would be really great if you could customize the services to different customers. So that instead of saying, OK, here's my service, take it or leave it, you can say, OK, you know, Mr. Customer Type A, you get this sort of very premium, fancy bells and whistles service, and you know, Mr. Economy Conscious Customer, you'll get the, the more basic and, and less um, high frills kind of service, and be able to do that in a way that doesn't require me to have a lot of different processes for those different services. So that's kind of all of the aspiration. Of, and, and the thing I didn't mention on this slide is, of course, cost. And I kind of leave that off just because, A, it's kind of obvious, and B, I think it's a mistake to focus only on cost. That I think, you know, if, if all you're going to do is drive cost out of your system, it's kind of a race to the bottom. And so while it is important to control cost, I think it's important to focus on the benefits in addition to just driving down cost. But obviously, you can't afford to ignore cost in any case. So this is a, a, another slide that's pretty much stolen from another Etsy white paper of sort of overall NFB architecture. And uh, just kind of, I, again, I kind of like this picture for a couple of reasons. One reason being that even though a lot of people kind of over fixate on taking what used to be in a box and putting it in a virtual machine and declaring success, um, what we actually see in this picture is this virtualization layer, what's labeled NFVI, or um, Network Function Virtualization uh, Infrastructure, has virtual compute, but it also has virtual storage and virtual networking. Um, and then sitting underneath that, you have the physical infrastructure, compute, storage, and networking. Above that, you have the virtualized functions. And so a virtualized function would be something like a, a virtualized firewall or a, a, a virtualized um, you know, instant messaging system, any of those things could, could run inside of VNF. And you can think of those as basically applications running in VMs. Um, and then you have to manage those things. So you have VNF managers. You also have to manage the infrastructure. And you have to orchestrate the whole thing. So it shouldn't take too much of a stretch for you to see how OpenStack sort of fits into this picture. Um, you know, OpenStack actually plays a lot over on the, the right-hand side here in terms of orchestration and also infrastructure management. And then if you kind of zoom in on the virtual infrastructure layer, you see kind of pretty good mapping of some of the components of OpenStack you know, with Nova for compute, Cinder or Swift for, um, for storage, and Neutron for, for networking. And it's that, that third piece, the networking piece, that I'm going to focus on um, in, the, in the rest of this talk.
Um, so I want to stress again that network virtualization is a different thing from network function virtualization. It's an un unfortunate sort of collision of terminology. But uh, network virtualization is what we do in uh, the product that I work on, NSX. It's what Neutron provides in OpenStack. Um, it's essentially about providing virtualized networking capabilities in, in a cloud data center. Network function virtualization is taking things like firewalls, um, voice over LTE systems, uh, you know, all kinds of telco functions, and virtualizing those comprehensively. So it's more the, the NFV is kind of an architectural shift from a siloed architecture to a cloud architecture. Network virtualization is a component that lets us provide virtual network services in the way that, that Neutron does. So um, at least for the purposes of this talk, you can think of NFV as the big picture and um, network virtualization as one component within that picture. And the reason that we need network virtualization um, first and foremost is that this whole system has to be agile. So, you know, if you're going to make this successful, it can't take you as long to provision a new service in this new architecture as it takes to provision it in the old architecture. And, you know, a good example of this is, you know, when we first started working on network virtualization, sort of back in the, I guess, late 2000s, like 2008, 2009, Lots of people thought they were going to go and stand up a public cloud service and compete against Amazon. And so you know, they, would, they would figure out some way to virtualize compute, some way to uh, manage the virtual compute, and then they would find that they couldn't actually automate the provisioning of virtual networks. That was actually the problem that got Nasira started, and it was the ability to fully automate the provisioning of virtual networks that led to, uh, to our you know, network virtualization product and also to ultimately the creation of quantum and then, and then neutron within, within OpenStack. Um, so making the whole thing agile and easy to automate is really critical. Um, the, the, uh, the another really important point is that you need multi-tenancy in these environments. You know, you're carrying the, the traffic for potentially you know, hundreds of millions of customers they're not all getting the same services. So you need to have some mechanism providing multi-tenancy. Um, you might also have different organizations within a single telco having control of different resources. So multi-tenancy comes up a lot. Um, and again, that's something where it's really hard to do that if you haven't virtualized the network. Um, you want to have network services that are independent of the underlying infrastructure. Um, so for example, if you want, say, logical routing between certain parts of a service, you don't necessarily want to have to go and go through a physical router, and you don't even necessarily want to have to go to a special virtual machine to get that routing function. It would be great, better if that was kind of built in to the network virtualization layer. Um, and then finally, service chaining, um, you know, the idea of taking multiple different services, sorry, multiple different functions and composing them into an actual useful end-to-end -end service. You want to be able to do that in a fairly dynamic way. So to be able to say, you know, customer A is going to get a firewall and a NAT and a load balancer, and customer B is going to get a video optimizer and some other function, and we're going to put those different classes of traffic into different service chains, that's going to be much more easy to do in an agile way if you have some software layer to stitch these functions together. Uh, so here's a, uh, a fairly uh, standard picture of, uh, of what Neutron looks like. Hopefully not too many surprises there. Um, and so, you know, Neutron provides you these APIs that let you do various things like create virtual networks, um, connect a virtual network to a virtual machine, create um, logical routers, and so on. And then, you know, over time, there's always a set of core APIs that let you access the kind of core Neutron services. And then you s tend to see these API extensions because there are all these different pluggable backends that offer different types of service. So, uh, you know, the product that I work on, NSX, um, provides its own pluggable backend, which sort of replaces the sort of default pl plugin for, for Neutron and lets you get access to the networking features of NSX. Some of those are core Neutron features. Some of them are accessed through the, uh, through the um, API extensions. Um, and so anyway, Neutron you know, essentially lets you perform all these network functions by calling APIs. And then there are various different consumers of those APIs that, let you, you know, that basically let the overall OpenStack system create services that, in, that contain um, networking components. OK, so what are people actually doing with NFV? 
Um, so part of my job is I, I kind of go around and talk to our telco customers and try to figure out what they really want to do with NFV. Um, and you know, while there is a lot of, of aspiration around NFV, there's two use cases that seem to come up again and again that we're actually seeing people put into, into pilots and, and early production. And essentially, these divide between two different types of, of operators. Um, the mobile operators are mostly focusing today on how to virtualize their evolved packet core. Um, and you know, the evolved packet core, I've got a picture coming up in a minute. But you can basically think of it as a set of functions that are responsible for getting packets from your mobile handset off to the internet and doing a bunch of things like making sure you get the right services based on your data plan. Um, and then uh, there's, so we, we see that as kind of one very popular use case, and there are some pretty big trials going on around the Evolve Packet Core. Um, and then the other one that we see a lot of <clears throat> for the operators who are um, fixed or wireline is doing some kind of virtualized CPE. So taking a set of functions that would have normally lived in a customer premise device, functions like firewalling, routing, maybe some, some uh, encryption, uh, those kind of functions, um, instead of doing it in a CPE, moving it into a virtual machine that's actually operated by the, the, uh, the operator and potentially not even on the customer premise. So just to go into these in a bit more detail, um, here's a, uh, a picture that I borrowed from somebody who actually understands mobile networks. And uh, the, the main thing to see here is that on the left-hand side, you've got the radio network. Um, that there is actually some work on doing virtualization out there, but it turns out to be fairly difficult to virtualize things out in the radio. So typically, you, you have the radio network, and then coming out of the radio network, there are a couple of interfaces that deliver uh, effectively packets into this Evolve Packet Core. And a bunch of stuff goes on in the Evolve Packet Core. I don't need to belabor that, but it's things like figuring out who you are, figuring out if you're authorized to get types of service, and then applying the correct services based on, on, on that information. And then ultimately, you want to get a connection to the internet or to some other data service, um, you know, potentially a corporate VPN. So there's a bunch of stuff that goes on in that Evolve Packet Core. And that's a sort of a standard telco architecture. And the thing you see there is quite a few different functions all traditionally implemented in different boxes. Um, and then uh, I, I, I mentioned the virtual CPE. So um, virtualized CPE is uh, you know, taking functions that you'd like your customer to have and which he might or he or she might expect to have running on their, on their premises, um, but actually uh, hosting those in a virtual environment. And uh, somewhat confusingly, it's not just a matter of taking things that lived on the customer premise and sticking them all inside a virtual machine. It's actually taking those functions and moving them into the cloud somewhere, typically into a, a data center that's run by the, the telco operator. And then you can run them inside virtual machines. So you still have to get the traffic from the customer premise into the data center somehow. Maybe you get it in over a L2 connection. Maybe you bring it in over an IPsec tunnel. Somehow you get the traffic from the customer premise to the uh, to the data center, but now all of the complicated services that are somewhat custom and that would traditionally have required configuring a box on the customer premise, all of those functions now get moved into a data center where they can be provisioned in software automatically by software. So this is actually a very compelling use case for how NFV can make an operator more agile because now they can, they can change the services that a customer gets very, very rapidly without having to go and visit the customer and reconfigure their, their equipment. And in this environment, um, network virtualization plays a pretty important role. Um, so if you look at network virtualization solutions, they come in a few different flavors. Uh, you know, most, uh, well, uh, quite a few vendors now have a network virtualization solution. Um, and some of them have just L2, some have just L3, some have a mix, some have firewalling. So those are, those are what I call the native network services that kind of come as part of your network virtualization solution. So you're going to get some of those services, which, for example, if you have a distributed firewall as part of your network virtualization solution, then you could offer firewalling services to the customer directly, as opposed to the picture up on the top there kind of suggests maybe running a firewall inside a virtual machine. And 
there's maybe a bit, a bit of subtlety here, but you, know, you can always run stuff in a virtual machine and make that a service available to a customer, but you don't necessarily always want to do it that way because of, of scaling issues uh, that it's often quite, more, quite a bit more efficient to actually make it sort of part of the virtual infrastructure layer. Um, clearly, I've mentioned that you want to be able to do this in a very agile way, and so you know, if I bring up a customer and that customer needs five different functions, I'm going to need to spin up a bunch of VMs, connect them together into a service. That means providing networking connectivity between those. And I want to do all of that without actually going and touching a, a networking device. I don't want to go and have to configure VLANs um, or you know, access control lists or any number of, of bits of hardware. I'd like to do this entirely in software. Um, I, I think I mentioned multi-tenancy already. Um, and this is now starting to get us into the topic of service chaining. So that picture on the top there is a very simple service chain. Um, and in the next slide, I'll go into some more detail on, on service chaining. And then the other thing is, you know, this is all pretty much independent of my underlying physical network topology, and it's also independent of location. So I've, you know, I can now offer these services to a customer pretty much anywhere I want, subject perhaps to latency concerns. But so you know, moving away from the old model where I would have had to say I have a cert certain set of functions that are actually located in boxes that are sitting somewhere, you know, now I can actually move these, these functions around very, very freely. And any time I move a function, I want it to stay connected to the other functions. So that means I need the networking to be agile as well. So um, you know, I, I know there's, I guess, a decent amount of information in this presentation. I hope there is. Um, but so I, I just want to stress again that like, if, if you only take away sort of one or two things from today, uh, I think a good part of, of what I'm trying to get you to understand is sort of how central the neutron and virtual networking piece is to this whole landscape. Um, so now I'm going to sort of go into sort of part two of the talk where I'll go into a bit more detail on service chaining. Um, so that picture at the top you've already seen, it's a, it's a chain of services. Um, and it's actually what I consider a, a kind of trivial service chain. Um, and a better example of a service chain would be something like this one down the bottom, which you'll notice is actually not a chain. It's more of a, a sort of a general graph. Um, and that's really a, a better way to think about service chains. They're really graphs of services. And you know, this is an example where the first box in the chain is doing classification. So now I'm going to figure out what kind, of, what kind of user does this traffic belong to? And based on that classification, what set of services will I give him? And then you know, based, I'll either take the, the upper or the lower path through those services to try to give something sort of custom to this, this class of customer. Um, creating that kind of topology of services, this is basically bread and butter for network virtualization. If you think about like what, what does Neutron do, what does network virtualization do, it basically lets you create topologies amongst virtual machines. So if you think of each of those VNFs being a function implemented in a virtual machine, a firewall, a NAT, a load balancer, a WAN optimizer, that you know, I, all I'm really doing with network virtualization is creating this topology. But I can now do that in an automated way and you know, with high agility. Um, so I was chatting with one of my colleagues just during the break, and he said, "So, like, what's actually hard about service chaining? Like, kind of, what's the big deal?" And I think what turns out to be difficult about it is, is I mean, none of it's rocket science. But the hard part is is ultimately about efficiently providing customized services and making sure that the packets go where they need to go. You know, traditionally, that was done by manually stitching things together using things like VLANs and routing to steer the packets between a set of boxes. So if you think about what we need to do in this fairly simple example, we need to classify the packet. And the classification could be drawing on quite a lot of data, some of which may not even be present in the packet. And at some point, we've classified the packet, and we've figured out that it needs to get some sort of service. So what we really want to do is store the result of that classification with the packet so that we don't ever have to classify it again. That's a classic example of metadata, that I want to carry something with the packet that tells me something about the packet that I can't actually figure out by looking at the packet. Um, so if you look at sort of where the arguments are heating up about how to implement service chaining, they tend to focus on how we carry metadata. Um, and if you look at VXLAN, which is the kind of the de facto standard for building network virtualization overlays, it actually doesn't have a good place to carry metadata. 
There's kind of some sort of hacky ways that you can carry it, but there's no kind of good general purpose way to carry metadata in a VXLAN header. Um, and so we've done some work on suggesting other ways of, of carrying this metadata. Um, there's another packet format called Genev that we're working on. Um, again, I don't need to go into details, but just to say that's kind of one of the core problems is I want to carry information about the packet all the way through this service chain. And you could even imagine, like, after the packet goes through VNF3, that chain could diverge again based on the class of the packet. So I might need to carry that metadata sort of all the way through a very long and complicated chain. Um, so that's, that's pretty, pretty critical. Um, there's another piece to this, um, which is that even though I'm drawing these chains as pretty simple things, if, you, if you're going to do this at scale, then you're going to have to probably have multiple um, instantiations of these virtualized functions. So you know, say that firewall function up the top might actually be implemented by 10 or 50 different virtual machines. So I better have a way to, to, to load balance the traffic across that, and I better have some kind of highly high availability story for how I deal with the, the failure of some, um, some kind of service. So um, those are the kind of things which I, I think need to get tackled in, um, in service chaining. And you know, as I've kind of alluded to, some of them are pretty straightforward today. Building topologies, not that hard. But um, carrying metadata, um, dealing with some things like load balancing, not, not entirely cooked today. Um, uh, here's a pretty useful reference if you want to read more. Um, that, that's from the IETF. Um, it's uh, written by a group of, of operators and vendors um, talking about how to do um, service chaining in a uh, um, mobility environment, like, like the Evolve Packet Core. Um, here's another um, service chaining example. Um, this is taken out of something that we do in the, the NSX product. Um, so the top picture is what you'd like things to look like logically. Um, things going between a couple of different virtual machines, um, going through a router, and also getting firewalled along the way. And then down the bottom is the sort of physical picture of, um, of how we'd like things to look. And, and so the sort of, actually I'll just back up a second. The sort of interesting thing here is that when traffic goes from, say, the web tier to the app tier, you don't just want it to follow the shortest path. You actually want it to follow a kind of non-obvious path through the, the firewall. So that's, a, that's another example of something that's kind of critical in service chaining, is you need to be able to redirect packets into functions that might not actually sit on the data path for those functions. Um, and that, again, can be done pretty straightforwardly by using overlay encapsulations. Um, but it can also be helpful to have some metadata to make sure that packets that need to go on this detour get there and others that don't need to get there, don't get there. Um, and then um, one of the things that, that we've implemented is we have a firewall that sits inside the hypervisor kind of as part of the vSwitch. So we do firewalling on traffic as it goes directly from the web tier to the app tier. But we also have the ability to selectively redirect traffic to a, um, to a third party firewall. So we can do kind of basic firewalling in the vSwitch and then more advanced firewalling in a virtual machine. And we don't send all the traffic to this third party firewall, but only a subset of it. Um, and so this is another example of kind of non-trivial service chaining, where even packets from a given customer might take different paths based on some, something that's either in the packet or in the metadata surrounding that packet. So that's kind of service chaining. Um, and I, I notice we're getting close to um, Q&A time here, so let me speed up a little bit. I just want to point out that so some of this stuff is just very basic neutron, like building topologies. You know, Neutron's really good at building virtual topologies, gives you the, all the ability you need to do that. And it does some amount of service insertion for things like load balancing and firewalling. Um, this is not really a complaint about Neutron, but there's, there's not a general purpose way to express that I want to attach metadata to, to packets. Um, Part of the reason is because there's not even a general agreement on how to do that in the networking community. Um, and then you know, some of the ways of inserting services, like inserting a service that's actually not in the data path for a packet, as far as I know, that's not supported in Neutron today, um, and nor is the idea of like selectively directing packets to a, to a service. So th th that was kind of my um, you know, kind of quick summary of like, if we're going to actually make this stuff really work with OpenStack, there's, there's some opportunity here to, to, to extend the sorts of things we do in the virtual networking layer of, uh, of OpenStack. So the very last thing I want to do is just my quick advertisement for OVN. 
Um, so OVN is pronounced oven, um, hence the logo kind of looks like an oven. Um, and it's built on top of the Open vSwitch project, which hopefully you've all heard of. So what do you need to know about Oven? Um, from this pr presentation, not very much, except that Oven provides a open source virtual networking layer that is basically targeting OpenStack environments. It's targeting a few other environments. But so you can think of Oven as a new option for providing open source virtual networking in OpenStack environments, which is clearly applicable to everything I've talked about. Um, it's going to support a whole lot of different capabilities like security groups, ACLs, logical switching and routing, um, can be mapped onto different, different types of overlay, um, and will support all the kinds of environments that OVS works on today. Um, and so if you were one of the fortunate few who put their hand up, you could have seen a demo on Tuesday. Um, and since many of you didn't put your hand up, that um, presentation has been videoed, and it's listed down there, um, o OVN, Native Virtual Networking for Open vSwitch. Um, you can also, if you're that way inclined, get involved in the development of OVN. It's, it's being done as a sub-project within Open vSwitch, um, and you can download the code and all kinds of stuff. You can read a blog about it. Um, so that's kind of all I wanted to say about OVN, um, but it's just, it's, I think it's actually a really exciting um, development Given that like, one hears a lot of negative things about neutron networking, um, at least I've heard quite a few this week, and I think often people conflate all these different components of neutron, and so you know, we actually have tremendously successful customers running on top of neutron on top of NSX, but most people probably don't run neutron on top of NSX. They run neutron with, say, the standard open vSwitch plugin. Um, here's another uh, attempt, at least, at providing an open source plugin that could be very um, scalable and robust for Neutron. So, um, to sum up, um, the, the, there's a lot of thrust behind NFV. Um, so, you know, no, uh, you know, this is kind of the old joke that with enough thrust, a, a pig will fly. Um, <clears throat> that may or may not be appropriate in this environment, but the, there's definitely a lot of people who really want to see NFV succeed. Um, I would count myself among them, um, but certainly you know, our largest telco customers really are betting very big on this. Um, I'm actually pleasantly surprised at how well NFE has taken off, that there was not that much incentive for traditional vendors to jump on the NFE bandwagon, but they seem to be responding to the wishes of their customers in a, a fairly uh, um, encouraging way. Um, so, you know, the big thing here, I think, is all about agility, about getting new services out quickly, and also making it easier for operator A to be differentiated from oper operator B. There is some amount of cost driving this, but I don't think it's the only thing to focus on by any means. Um, we, there's actually a, a lot of overlap, or it's certainly a lot of interest in OpenStack from the NFV community. Um, that's kind of interesting because you know I think most of you pro would probably agree that OpenStack is kind of not for the faint of heart. Um, that you know, requires a fairly high level of sophistication, and I think a lot of the telcos are just effectively saying, you know, we're going to make the investment to become OpenStack experts because we see it as the best thing out there for managing these these kind of sort of cloudy environments. Um, I didn't really talk much about this, but. NFV is really about moving away from siloed architectures to more open architectures. And one of the things we need to be very careful of is that we don't end up in just a different set of silos. So if today you know, I sell traditional telco equipment, and tomorrow I stick it in a virtual machine and then put a hypervisor underneath it and bundle the whole thing up and sell that on my own hardware, I've only replaced one silo with another and inserted the extra cost of a hypervisor. So that's kind of not a good outcome. So what we really need is more kind of open horizontal architectures. Um, that's kind of the approach that, that we're taking in the, the, the work that I do at VMware. It's also the approach that the OpenStack community kind of broadly takes. So I think that's another reason why OpenStack is so interesting for, uh, for NFE. Um, and I, I think I've I hammered this point enough now is that you know, doing NFE, it's not just about virtualizing compute. It's about virtualizing everything. And that means networking and storage. Uh, and so, you know, hopefully I've made that pretty obvious and uh, you can get a sense of what it's going to take to make NFE successful. So with that, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice, but um, thank you for your time and I'm happy to take a few questions. Oops, or applause, if you prefer. <laughs> <laughs>
Sorry, that was horrible to have to beg for it. But um, sorry, qu anyway, question there. So, so quick question. Um, you, you talked a lot about service chaining and the need for uh, metadata. I think there's been a lot of work that's been done on a network services header. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that and how your system uh, kind of, or, or the way you approach that here. Yeah, so, so the network services header is, I think, a, a good example of one of the approaches to carrying metadata. Um, I think it's, it's basically work going in the right direction. Um, and essentially, we're at that sort of stage. And I, I spent many years going to the IETF, and I, I don't go as much as I used to. But um, we're sort of at the stage now of arguing about exactly where the bits go on the packet, as opposed to the overall structure of information. So I'd say that's kind of a good thing. Great. OK. Great to see that there. Other, other questions? I was told to allow time. A super quiet audience. Was it all crystal clear? <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right, well, we should quit. Oh, here's, here's, here's a question. Okay. Um, Yeah, actually, so, so I'll just repeat the question for those who didn't hear it. So the question was, um, given that there are already some open approaches to doing virtual networking, why do we need another one? And I think that there was a sense that uh, we needed to, you know, open vSwitch is still the most popular, um, you know, it's the most popular vSwitch in OpenStack environments. And we wanted to make open vSwitch kind of a first class candidate for virtual networking in uh, in OpenStack environments. So we kind of looked at this as not so much let's go and build another virtual networking solution so much as let's incrementally grow the capabilities of OVS so that, you know, one of the reasons why people have had mixed experiences with Neutron is because the default OVS plugin is kind of not that great. Um, and so having something that's more robust as the default would, would I think, be a big win. Uh, other questions? Okay, we're going to get a follow-up from the front desk, front front row here. Ah, so yeah. So the question was about: Can you pass VLAN tags all the way up to the guest with with OVN? Um, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, but I, I know that like adding such a capability would be pretty straightforward. Um, so. Whether it's getting done, like there's a long roadmap of things to do with OVN, but definitely that could be done. Um, okay, if there's no one else, so, oh, here we go. One, one last one. Yeah, I was wondering, any estimate on when the optimized version of the OVS would be out? So any, sorry, what, could you repeat that question? Uh, any estimate on when the optimized version of the OVS? So when you say the, so the question is, when will the optimized version of OVS be out? So that, so are you talking about any particular optimization? Because we're kind of optimizing it all the time. So it would be the DPDK version. Ah, so the DPDK version of OVS. I mean, as far as I know, that's available today. Um, that uh, I'm not sure exactly what state of maturity the DPDK version of OVS is in, but there is definitely a, a version today. Um, so uh, th that's a long discussion about all the pluses and minuses of DPDK. But in general, if you want, to, if you have an environment where you need a DPDK optimized version of OVS, I'm pretty sure it's available today. OK. Well, the questions are getting further and further from my expertise, so this is a good time to stop. Um, thank you so much for your time. <laughs>